Thank you, Munir. Thank you for the invitation. I, I guess I'm a very different phenotype to most of the crowd here. Um, I'm not a geneticist, although we all use the sequence now. <clears throat> I guess I, the hats I wear when I'm doing science as opposed to running the institute would be a molecular pharmacologist, a chemical biologist, and a drug discoverer, because we run one of the biggest academic drug discovery units in the world, uh, discovering cancer drugs. And I think it's worth... So what you're going to hear from me, really, is the, is the perspective, particularly in the early part of the talk, of how we think about the sequence and somatic genetics. Um, when we're discovering drugs, taking them in, my main clinical interaction is with our phase one unit, so I work very closely with the first in man, first in human uh, studies. And so I'll tell you about that. I'll also tell you ab about how the whole field is moving. And I, I maybe for this group, and I know for the way NHS England and um, you know, the 100,000 genomes, and I think it's halfway, is it today or yesterday? They got to the halfway point. Congratulations. That's, that's great. Really cool. It's, it's going to be great when we get it all together. And um, huge uh, praise to those who've been grappling with the problems. Um, but I really want to take you beyond the initial... And by the way, that cartoon of here's my sequence, we, we see that. You know, we see people coming into our clinics with foundation medicine sequence and some know what to do with it and, and, and others don't. So we, so we do see that. Um, I'm going to take you, though, beyond how, what we deal with the initial actionable mutations, which I know is the current challenge. We're going to take you through the huge challenge of drug resistance, the need for adaptive longitudinal um, monitoring, which we have to grapple with. That's the problem now. Using circulating tumor DNA, I'm sure, is going to be the way forward. And I'll show you examples from clinical academics, clinician scientists within my institute who are using this type of approach in cutting-edge trials now. So that's, that's the, what I'll tell you about. And I hope it fits with your you know, the overall theme of, of, of the meeting. I think it's worth just saying before I, because I'm discussing um, somatic genetics, just on the issue of the sorts of things that you've just been discussing where I have to say I've never heard of most of those drugs because I don't do that. Um, warfarin I get. Um, the others not yet, anyway, receiving them. Um, so is that we try and design out all those liabilities. So hopefully drugs that we develop discover and develop for the future don't have transporter problems and, and uh, you know, polymorphic SIPs and, and so on. Um, if you design those out in, in, in a really good drug molecule, then that, that really helps avoid those problems in the future. So I won't talk too much about the genetics of um, side effects. So um, I think cancer is where, if you go back to 2000, cancer is... <clears throat> the field that has really charged forward and has used um, the genome sequence and somatic genetics, obviously, because it's a, it's a disease of uh, mutated DNA uh, caused by either uh, normal replication or um, carcinogens, of course. Um, and the objective is, is uh, as in all of this type of thing, to get the right drug to the right patient at the right, at the right time. And that's a really big issue in cancer because the genome sequence changes with time. Of the, of the cancer. Yeah? Cancers have unstable <coughs> genomes, mostly. Uh, they evolve with time, adapt, evolve, change. And so you need to, uh, you know, just having a single sequence that's done um, often on the primary tumor, let alone the metastatic tumor at the outset, um, is, is insufficient. So I'm going to go back further than 2000. I'm just going to go back because I've spent a long time in this place in Cambridge. Um, it really does go back to personalized medicine, goes back in a way to when Watson and Crick famously in the year after I was born predicted or suggested the, modestly the structure uh, that might be quite useful or biologically interesting. And then Crick sometimes later, this is really why I put, put this on, Crick predicted, um, he didn't get it completely right, but he predicted that around 2000, you know, we'll be doing massive scale research and um, things will be very different in 2000 than than they were then in the, in the 70s. And, and indeed they are. 2000 was around the time when um, molecularly targeted um, molecular medicines for cancer really took off. 
I'll tell you my own experience in that in the early days of one of those. And so these were the papers that um, you've already heard, uh, heard about. We know this, so just to get us on, on track. Um, and of course, those papers led to the equivalent lay magazines that predicted that cures for cancer and all disease would roll off the roll out of labs in, in, in short order. And I guess in cancer that's true. Gleevec came quickly, Herceptin, and the drug, uh, the first, one of the first EGFR inhibitors that I led the biology of the discovery of when I was at AstraZeneca for four years, um, which I think is on the next slide, next but one. So what, what the notion really interesting that it took 30 years after the discovery of the first oncogenes like RAS and SARC and, and so on, some of, them, some of which are actionable kinases, took the pharmaceutical industry and academia in pharmacology about 30 years to realize that they should move from cytotoxic chemotherapy, which blasts everyone's DNA, has a very limited uh, therapeutic index, cures some cancers, childhood leukemias and uh, testicular cancers, but mostly, uh, and has a big effect in breast cancer and others, but not the molecular medicines that we, that we would like. So after that period of adjustment, uh, when people really got the message that if you have a genetic disease with a genetic mutation and you can tackle that, the protein that's encoded by that, for example, altered switched on kinase or a loss of function that gives you a predisposal to synthetic lethality as with BRCA mutation predisposing to PARP inhibitors that we might hear about later. Um, a, a great story for us because BRCA2 was discovered by uh, Alan Ashworth and Mike Stratton at the ICR. Uh, and uh, then Alan went on to, to action, if you like, the first pharmacological and medical use of synthetic lethality, which had been a genetic concept prior to, prior to that. I'm not going to talk too much about, about that. So this is the paradigm that we work with. Cancer, the discovery of cancer genes gives you the opportunity with a validated target, and that's still a big issue, validate, target validation, um, gives you the opportunity for a new targeted drug with a biomarker for patient selection dialed in uh, from the outset to be validated, but uh, it's there from the beginning which patients to, to, to treat. Um, and of course, you bring those together in personalized medicine. And so you're, 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 cancer is the disease of, cancer, uh, of uh, faulty genes. You uh, find the Achilles heel, which is the uh, tumor has become, as we call it, addicted to, let's say, a particular kinase. Uh, and then you put this together. And I'll come back to this point. I refer to uh, develop, conceptualize this idea within cancer. It's been used in other therapeutic areas now. It's something I call the pharmacologic audit trail, where you want to know all the information and decision making, particularly in early drug development and in discovery, from target engagement all the way through to biomarker for pathway modulation through to um, therapeutic effect and indeed side effects. And the beginning of the audit trail is built into all drug discovery projects because you've, you're going for that particular somatic alteration that leads to a faulty on switch often or a break gene that's lost that gives you synthetic lethal opportunity. So this is my first exposure to this field and it's rather interesting. Uh, so this is gefitinib and I led the biology of this project when I was at what was then Zeneca, had just stopped being ICI uh, in... Uh, the 90s, uh, and at that time the EGFR mut mutations had not been discovered, so we were targeting EGFR because it was overexpressed in lung and certain other cancers, and we thought that might be the biomarker for uh, patient selection, high levels of expression, uh, so we discovered the drug uh, before the genome sequences were done. The clinicians then noticed a high res higher response rate in adenocarcinomas in women with lung cancer and in never smokers and Japanese and East <coughs> Asians. So this, the patients were enriched for responders that had those phenotypic characteristics. And in these two big papers um, from Boston, the um, discovery was made by somatic genome resequencing that it was the uh, patients with EGFR activating mutations that responded to ERESA. Uh, and uh, or much stronger likelihood of, of response. So um, these are two of the early studies that showed, as you can see, that the response, the survival rates were, even though interestingly EGFR mutation is a positive prognostic 
factor. So patients with lung cancer that have this mutation do better than those with other mutations. But if you have this mutation, then you get treated with um, gifitinib or elotinib. And this is the early data. And then um, this is a typical patient that responded. Here you can see a chest full of tumor and um, a before and after type of response. And this translates in a Japanese study later on where they looked at patients before um, the introduction of, of uh, gifitinib first line uh, approval and, and those after, and you can see a very clear survival, uh, a survival benefit. And other great success stories from that time, of course, were Gleevec, um, which is the kinase that inhibits um, chronic myeloid leukemia, the kinase that's able kinase that's activated by translocation, another famous story, and amplification of, of um, the HER2 receptor tyrosine kinase, which then uh, predicts response to the antibody Herceptin. So these were the great early, early poster childs and success stories of um, targeted medicine uh, against somatic mutations that are causative of cancer. And if you just bring that, because I've been talking about non-small cell lung cancer, um, I just thought I'd sort of bring you up to date in a teaching slide that I use. So you, you now see that in, in the early days, you know, there was a bunch of RAS mutations, which we still can't treat. These are insensitive to targeted therapies, and there's no RAS drug, although everybody's working on that, but it's hard to drug. Um, there's 10% of EGFR. Everything else was unknown. Then slowly, all these other actionable mutations for which there are now several inhibitors available um, came in, but still there's a, still a bunch of unknowns. And then, of course, more recently, immune oncology with the T-cell checkpoint inhibitors has come in in lung cancer and melanoma in particular and other tumors, and that's really revolutionizing therapy. And these work across the different um, somatic mutation subsets for, um, of the conventional way that, that this disease is sliced. So it's a very complex uh, environment now, the treatment of, of lung cancer. And outcomes are still not great. I just want to put this in the context of timeline risks and costs. As a drug discoverer, I use these in, in my um, sort of keynote lecture type uh, presentations. And the key thing here is um, that it still takes a long time and it's still expensive. And even if you argue about how the costing's done, which people do, it's still expensive and, and slower than it would ideally be, and there's still 10% uh, or 90% attrition from uh, entry into phase one through to approval or not. And so the way to get this right, I'm not going to talk about most of this, but it's to choose the right target in the first place, and that's a big debate in the field about reproducibility and, and, and so on that we're very active with, with chemical probes as well as uh, genetic tools. Using the right test to develop the drug, using, of course, choosing the best possible molecule, which should be potent, selective, obviously designed out for pumps and transporters and, and things you don't want to hit like SIPs and, and, and so on. But selecting the best biomarker and then using that to design the optimal clinical trial is closer to, the, I think, the, um, the interest of this, of this community. And clearly, if you know the somatic mutation that you're targeting, then you have a predictive assay from the beginning. You know the pathway that you're blocking. You have PD biomarkers for target engagement and pathway modulation. And that forms the pharmacologic audit trail that I, that I mentioned to you. Just wanted to show this as a prelude into a couple of slides I'm going to show on some of the work that we've done, just as examples of drugs that are coming through now. But I guess we have responded um, for the last 20 years uh, before I took over as head of the whole institute, I ran the drug discovery group for close to 20 years. Uh, and we formed part of what Nature later described as this integrated ecosystem where actually it becomes much more integrated between basic research and pharma with academia drug discovery being able to take on some of the very high risk work, validating proof of concept, partnering with industry and trying to get higher risk projects um, and avoid the, you know, the lemming-like syndrome of of, of much of pharma focusing on a very small number of uh, identical targets. So this is what we do. You can just scan, scan through this. You'll see why I'm going to show this in a moment. We decided to set up a, an academic center of excellence to combine with the Royal Marsden to bridge the gap um, at scale, tackling pioneer targets and taking early risk. Most of them were somatic mutation uh, addiction targets to begin with, although we've moved on. Uh, showing proof of concept, valley of death, partnering appropriately, and, and just helping to move uh, things forward through bottlenecks that were hitherto problematic. And 
Interestingly, if you go back well before my time, drugs like melphalan, crambacil, raltitrexed were discovered at the ICR. So there's a long tradition. But since 2005, we've taken, uh, we've discovered 20 drug candidates, and nine of those have progressed with, with partners in, in many cases. And I guess the most famous drug we have is, is our abiraterone uh, drug that uh, is, um, blocks the synthesis of testosterone in the tumor, in the adrenals, and um, wherever. Uh, and um, thereby blocks testosterone synthesis and blocks the androgen drive of uh, late-stage prostate cancer. Um, so this is the pharmacologic audit trail. Um, just thought I'd put this in because it's a useful concept. It can be used in other diseases, and I know it is. The idea is that you have a biomarker for patient selection. Obviously, PK is essential, a, bio a biomarker for target modulation, uh, a, a biomarkers for downstream effects, uh, biomarkers for tumor response, whether they're seen or predicted, and then more classical measures, survival, CT scans, and, and so on, and of course toxicity measures as well. So all of those things in cancer, if done well, are generally well carried out, uh, and we therefore gain a lot of information about the drug before they move into um, later stage trials and, and approval. Not always. So this is our drug abiraterone. Crystal structure shown here um, blocks um, a particular cytochrome that synthesizes testosterone. Uh, and although it was uh, the hypothesis was not believed in the early days of, of the discovery of this drug, um, is now standard of care for um, late stage metastatic prostate cancer and has just been uh, approved for by the European Medicines Agency, FDA for. Uh, first-line treatment in combination with standard endocrine treatment. This is another drug, uh, and essentially all patients with, almost all patients with prostate cancer at that stage is driven by androgen, so patient selection is not difficult. You don't particularly need a biomarker for, for that. Here's a drug that we now are showing activity. Uh, it's a targeted cytotoxic, which is taken up by the alpha folate receptor, and where we see 50% 70% response rate in phase one clinical trials in patients with ovarian cancer that overexpress the alpha folate receptor. So we think an immunohistochemistry assay for overexpression of the folate receptor, this is not a mutation, this is an overexpression of the receptor, um, will be the predictive biomarker for this patient population if it goes through to uh, later stage development. Here's our check one inhibitor, which is a, uh, a checkpoint kinase inhibitor. This is not the T cell checkpoints, immune checkpoints, this is the cell cycle checkpoint. Uh, you can see the rationale here is you either combine it with chemotherapy to accelerate the drug damage, DNA damage, or you can use it in MYC dependent cancer. See, so an example of a MYC driven uh, cancer here, and neuroblastoma would be a tumor type that's very MYC uh, dependent. And this is just entering phase one clinical trial with these biomarkers predictive. Now we get into the serious problem that we face in cancer. Let's suppose you do all that other stuff well, and there's still a problem with <clears throat> the ability to action a genome sequence because of the 500 or so cancer genes in the cancer genome um, uh, repository that's run, kept by the Sanger. Only about, last time we did the calculation, only about 5% of those genes are actionable with a, with a drug. That's because many of them are undruggable but just because others have not yet been, been tackled. So um, there's still a huge gap just with the primary initial um, sequence and the ability to action that with a, <clears throat> a particular drug. But here's the, here's the further problem, which is, this is, of course, Darwin's famous sketch of the evolution of species, and exactly the same thing happens. This is a schematic of the original clone. Much of this was worked out by Mel Greaves in our uh, institute and then uh, exemplified in solid tumors by Charlie Swanton more recently, that you get the evolution of clones as predicted by Howell and his Sowell in his um, science paper in the 1970s. You get, with, with environmental pressure and then with the pressure of selection by the drug, you get um, strong selective pressure for resistance to develop, further mutations or adaptive gene expression changes and, and what have you. And here's an example of an evolutionary tree of two different renal cancers that came out of the, um, uh, uh, the New England Journal paper of Charlie Swanton that showed in renal cancer that what also is known to happen in leukemias. This now is known to happen in, 
in all cancers. So you get the truncal mutations and then you get these branching mutations and you get a Darwinian selection in the presence of the drug, often second site mutations or bypass pathways and, and so on, uh, and other mechanisms that we don't always understand. And this is the classic picture that shows if you like the fantastic progress, but all the, also the remarkable challenge that we have. This is a patient with metastatic melanoma everywhere who responds dramatically, so driven by BRAF, 50% of melanoma patients driven by a BRAF mutation, uh, activates cell division. Then you, get, you, treat with the, you treat the addiction to that BRAF kinase with the drug that inhibits the BRAF protein. You take away the drive, you clear out the tumor, and then... <clears throat> A matter of a few weeks later, rampant tumor comes back resistant to the VEMRF. And it, the genome resequencing then finds multiple ways by which you can, including mutations that block the binding of VEMRF and to the kinase, of course. That's a common uh, way of getting resistance. And it's for that reason that when we redid our research strategy in my institute with Royal Marsden, our partner, um, and published it last year, we decided that we would focus on cancer's complexity, adaptability, and evolution as the main challenge that we face in, the, in, in both in the, the research strategy uh, for our lab work and also our, our clinical work. Now, we'll come back to that. So this is just to show you there's more to it than simple um, uh, genetics. So microenvironment inf influences, particularly with the immune response and so on, are important. This is the work of a fantastic young faculty member in our institute, Yin Yin Huan, who showed in this PLOS medicine paper a couple of years ago that when she does what she calls an e ecosystem diversity uh, index, she looks at an H&E across a tumor and looks at the complexity, the different types of cells, and the way they're distributed using machine learning and advanced image recognition uh, analysis uh, technologies of this type of patterns comes up with a, a diversity index and then shows that the, the microenvironmental diversity is itself predictive for outcome. If you, uh, and P53 in this case is predictive for outcome. This is in a particular type of breast cancer. And if you combine the ecosystem heterogeneity with the, um, with, on top of the somatic genetics, in this case P53 loss, you get a better predictive outcome. So the likelihood is we're going to have to. Have to we're going to have to add in to <clears throat> our overall prediction algorithms, which I'll come back to at the end using machine learning and artificial intelligence type approaches, much more complexity, image analysis, and, 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 and so on, on top of the genome sequence, which is itself quite uh, complex already. This is her further work that shows uh, that in ER positive breast cancer, if she looks at the way using this, so here's an H and E section. She pulls out the cancer cell density. She looks at the lymphocyte density and also the uh, distribution and spatial clustering of different types of lymphocytes and other immune cells in the tumor. And she shows independently that that, uh, that behavior, purely uh, using digital pathology, of course, but purely from the H&E section, can again predict outcome. This is an exciting new area that um, <clears throat> of course, requires digital pathology to be uh, taken up more effectively and, and used in this way, which is research at the moment. This just tells you, reminds me, before I move on to the final section, that it's not just about T-cell checkpoint inhibitors that are being brought in now. Uh, it's also about all the other types of immune mechanisms, innate immunity and other mechanisms that can be activated, viral uh, uh, approaches, vaccines, and so on, are really coming coming in now. And interestingly, although the discovery of the T-cell checkpoint inhibitors was very heavily based on beautiful um, basic research, understanding the function of the, of the, of the T-cells, which were actually first discovered in the Institute by Jacques Miller, who just got the Japan Prize, which we celebrated recently for him, um, there were no predictive biomarkers for activity or toxicity when the T-cell checkpoint inhibitors came in, and not everybody responded. Um, and it was only later that things like mutation load, expression of PD-1, expression of PDL one were retrospectively found to be, to some extent, predictive. It's a little bit like my experience with Iressa, gifitinib, where the drug went in before the predictive biomarkers were eventually discovered through clinical work. So there's much more to do here. And the side effects are quite severe in some patients, and that needs predicting as well. Um, Many asked me to, to mention that. So I just want to 
show you a little bit about uh, what is the next exciting area here, which is if you want to be able to follow longitudinally what's happening in the tumor and how it's evolving, responding, and maybe predict that and, how, and anticipate how it might respond and change the treatment to stay ahead of the evolution of the cancer, then clearly you can't rely on tumor biopsies. And the way to do that is, is to look at the circulating tumor DNA that's released into the blood of patients through this cartoon, shows you how that happens. That's picked up in about 90% of patients with metastatic breast cancer. You can then sequence that. Uh, and um, uh, it often running at, at very low levels, requiring very sensitive assays like droplet PCR and so on. But um, this is very actively being researched. I'll show you an example. So this is uh, Nick Turner, who <clears throat> I think is the leader of the GCEP in breast from our institution. Uh, and this is his so-called plasma match study, uh, which is a, as you can see, it's a trial where circulating tumor DNA in metastatic patients is screened by digital PCR uh, or um, sequenced, or genome or whole exome sequenced. And then if there's an actionable mutation, you can see the uh, possibilities within this trial for patients to be entered into these different uh, components and to be switched. And these are just two examples of a patient. This is actually a drug that we uh, discovered the precursor of at our institute, then worked with Aztecs and licensed it to AstraZeneca, who completed the project. So this is a PKB inhibitor in combination with an anti-endocrine therapy. Patient with an AKT mutation with an AKT inhibitor and having a nice response in that uh, plasma match type trial. And here's a patient with um, a HER2 mutation getting a very potent and specific HER2 inhibitor in combination with steroid and, again, responding well. And uh, also predicting, this is again Nick's work, predicting relapse with serial uh, circulating tumor uh, DNA sampling. And you can see some of the early data here that suggests the um, predictive value uh, of predicting relapse early uh, with a median lead time from this early work of about eight months. So you can predict, predict relapse happening. We got similar data from Gert Attard and Johan de Bono in prostate cancer. So the ability to do genome sequencing in circulating uh, DNA is revolutionizing uh, trials and I think will uh, probably uh, become in due course routine uh, treatment. It's a little bit like following patients with HIV with occasional tests for viral titra, I guess. That might be the closest thing I can think of. But here, of course, you're going beyond that to look at the, the mutations in the circulating DNA and anticipating whether that will lead to resistance to the current therapy and then switch the therapy ahead of time so that you can really stay ahead of treatment. And this is uh, Nick's C-Track study, again in breast. This is for triple negative breast cancer, very poor outcomes for these patients. Again, it's designed based on circulating tumor DNA uh, assays and based on their baseline uh, readouts, they're either given uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors or um, <clears throat> control. And that's a study that's also underway. Again, you can see it's been driven by circulating tumor DNA as the, as the biomarker for, for the study. Just a little glance forward, here's a, a paper that's just coming out from Chris Lord who's following up the synthetic lethal studies that he did with Ashworth in a lap rib and breast and showing that here's a, a group of patients with e-cadherin gene mutations that predicts for sensitivity to ROS1 kinase inhibitor. And the MET inhibitor, crisotinib, that's already approved clinically, inhibits ROS, uh, and uh, uh, clinical trials are already underway in phase two with that, with that drug. So it's um, ROS1 mutations, uh, sorry, somatic e-cadherin -cadher gene mutations predicting sensitivity to a ROS1 kinase inhibitor. So this is, I went onto the uh, um, Genome England website and saw what the, this is, uh, it's not anonymized, it's kind of averaged in some way, I, I, you will understand better than I do. But I, I noted here that um, in due course when all of this stuff is worked out by your community, um, some kind of uh, record of this type, and you heard the type of thing that's going on at Vanderbilt, will come to the point of care and then actionable uh, gene somatic mutations and indeed germline, I guess, because integration will happen, uh, will come through. 
And so we need to think beyond that now into how it will look like with drug resistance and the adaptability of that, even beyond what these early readouts will, will look like. But even this of itself will be, I think, great progress. Uh, and again, I, co I compliment the group on the, on the progress made. So I just want to finish with what treatment might look like if you sort of integrate all of that um, <clears throat> and think about the potential for machine learning, deep learning, and so on. That, um, of course, with IBM Watson being tried in various places, including Anderson, although they've moved away from that, and, and a repository that we're building called the Knowledge Hub, the notion would be that you collect all data and you can see it all there. <clears throat> this is what I was alluding to when I talked about Union's work where she's looking at digital pathology and information that can be extracted from that. But all of this information as well. And, of course, the incorporation of that into our knowledge hub. This is our example with all the AI and machine learning techniques. We'll identify treatment algorithms that would then recommend single or drug combinations that could be, could be used for individual patients at a specific time. That patient will be treated, the data would, uh, outcomes would be improved, hopefully, and the data would continue to uh, heuristically learn through the, uh, through the approach here. And that's, I think, something that we would see happening and we, uh, in, in the next five to, to ten years. And Vistan Lazikani, who's our computational biology head in the Institute, excuse me, <clears throat> is interacting with Genome England to try and see how this um, type of activity could be. Uh, you can see some of it could be incorporated. Here's some of the things that Bissan's uh, involved with. I want to show you one example, uh, which is a radiotherapy trial, actually, where we're actually using this approach of collecting all data, uh, uh, in, in this case from the CHIP trial, which is a, a hyperfractionation, high-dose intensity <coughs> radiotherapy trial for prostate cancer led by David Dernley. It's got 3,000 patients and the outcomes for that. Um, these patients all got the same dose and schedule but have very different long-term side effects. Uh, and some of the factors involved are radiation dose, genetic predisposition, um, and, and, and other factors, but they don't predict very well. So the question Bisan asked in this study with David is kind of multimodal, multiparametric approach with, with combination radiotherapy, dose genetics, comorbidities, et cetera, be predictive for uh, outcome. And um, you know, this is the type, this so-called graph-based clinical knowledge bases, which is how this type of uh, data tends to be uh, or is handled. <coughs> the knowledge hub that we built has data for now 450 million data points for 9,000 patients on this trial uh, and allows us to develop predictive models using all the available data. And this is, um, if you can actually see this running now, but those are the responders, okay? This runs repeatedly. It's sorting itself out and finding in brown that group of responders. So Using that very large number of data points, AI technology is predicting independently patients that have the worst side effects. It's based on a combination at the moment. Some of the factors are unknown, but it's dosimetry, genetics, SNPs, patient reported outcomes, and clinician reported outcomes. And the deep learning has so far condensed this information into 74 features that predict very well for rectal bleeding, which is a major problem for clinicians. So our radiotherapists are now completely convinced that whereas previously AI was something for, um, you know, youngsters with, uh, with um, whatever they use AI for, um, this is now something that uh, is affecting their, potentially affect their patients. So we're really excited about applying this to other, to other projects. Um, cost is a big issue. I wrote something on this that you, I just thought I'd mention here. So just to summarize, sorry if I've gone over. Um, so in cancer, there's no doubt that personalized medicine is, is dialed in from the beginning and, and we're living with it now. There are many molecularly targeted drugs that are approved um, with a genomic predictive biomarker on the label, but we have a long way to go to have drugs for all actionable or potentially actionable mutations. Probably 90-odd percent are still to be uh, drugged. The immune oncology drugs are coming in with huge impact. We need biomarkers for them. The major clinical trials is what, uh, challenge is what I showed you of tumor adaption, heterogeneity, and resistance. No good getting a response to a kinase inhibitor for three months and then the tumor's back rampantly active, resistant in uh, a few weeks of uh, treatment. Uh, that requires clever combinations and uh, much more clever and new types of targets. So I think clearly, though, implementing genome sequencing in the NHS in the first place with the initial diagnostic. Um, biopsy is 
or, or um, uh, uh, material is, is essential with decision support systems for actionable results coming through, and I applaud that activity. But we do need to move quite quickly to longitudinal sequencing methods so that we can uh, stay ahead of the cancer. Um, and I think big data is probably the way that we'll all see this happening in the future. These are representative collaborators that capture the whole group of people that I would like to thank, and, and thanks for listening. Hope it was useful.